So it's my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker. It's a scientist whose career I've been following for quite some time. He's, he's got some potential, maybe. So what I would like to talk about is minimizing stress to facilitate viable embryo development. I think it's important to acknowledge that when we work in a laboratory, we are working in an artificial environment. And consequently, we introduce various forms of stresses. So ultimately, what we're going to do is have to make some kind of compromise. And embryo culture and viable embryo culture is the result of a balance between those two. Here we have uh, a standard tissue culture incubator and our drops of culture medium in a polystyrene dish overlaid with oil. And we talk about getting towards physiology. But on the right-hand side, here's the female reproductive tract. The embryo is undergoing its incredibly dynamic period of pre-implantation development, but it's exposed to a very varied nutrient environment and as it develops from the zygote to the blastocyst, the embryo itself is continuously moving. So it, there are no unstirred layers around the embryo. The embryo is in direct communication with the mother. And this is a cross section of a human fallopian tube in which the embryo would reside. And it's quite clear from that and the proximity of the embryo to the mother that whatever factors or metabolites are produced by the embryo can be taken up by the mother and vice versa. So it's a highly dynamic system. So the laboratory in no way equates to what's happening in vivo in those regards. So consequently, as we work in vitro, we create stresses. And sometimes we don't even know we're doing it. If you have a stress in the laboratory, one of the first things you'll notice is that you'll get slower embryo development. But things that you can't actually see that we can measure are altered metabolism, gene expression. We can quantitate those, culminating in reduced viability. So stress is a real issue when we work in vitro. So what are the known sources of stress? There are several here. Serum supplementation, which I'm pleased to say that I hope to say that no one else is uh, doing these days. Poor medium composition with inappropriate nutrients. The emission of amino acids, the inclusion of amino acids. That's a bit of a paradox, which I'll come back to. Oxygen, the very gas that gives us life is the one that ultimately kills us. And if we use the wrong concentration, it really damages our embryos. I would even advocate that premature replacement of an embryo in the uterus, putting a cleavage stage embryo back in the uterine environment, is a stress well documented in animal models. The shear force through pipetting, I'll come back to that, temperature shifts, pH shifts, and growing embryos on their own. So these are all possible sources of stress, even contact supplies. But this is the list of things I'll just review very briefly over the next few minutes. So inappropriate nutrients. Remember, the oviduct does not equate to the uterus in any shape or form in its physiology, nor the contents of the lumen, specifically when it comes down to uh, nutrients and cytokines and growth factors. These are some data, well dated, where we were able to analyze neat oviduct and uterine fluid from patients naturally cycling, and we were able to develop a picture of what nutrients were present in the oviduct and the uterus. And you can see there were gradients there so much so that the early embryo is exposed to higher levels of pyruvate and lactate, and the later embryo sees more glucose. And it was from these observations 20 years ago that we formulated the medium G1, G2, and the backbone was the levels of nutrients in the oviduct and uterus in the human. So these were designed on human data, human physiology. Now these gradients aren't passive. If you look at embryos grown either in a constant nutrient concentration or a gradient, you'll see some effects. The first study, again, dates back some 20 years with Danny Sachs and myself, where we were looking at mouse embryos grown at different lactate concentrations. And what we found was that pre-compaction, embryo viability was supported by a higher lactate level, such as what was seen in the oviduct. Conversely, post-compaction, a lower lactate environment favored higher viability. And what we know about lactate is it's key in regulating the redox, together with pyruvate, the redox within a cell. Subsequent studies by Michelle Lane and myself, looking at it again, how lactate and pyruvate regulate uh, the nutrient utilization. And this, the cleavage stage embryo and blastocysts have completely different requirements and utilization of carboxylic acids, and the redox created by them 
affects the glucose metabolism. So they're not passive. I need to say that quite strongly. Now, we have documented, and many labs have documented, that amino acids are highly beneficial in an embryo culture environment. But one of the problems is, is that, again, we're working in vitro. And amino acids are labile, so they spontaneously break down to release ammonium. Furthermore, to add insult to injury, the embryo itself can produce ammonium through the transamination of amino acids. And these series of studies here have documented some adverse effects of ammonium on embryo development, and, and there are many more than that. This data set from uh, 2001 from the Colorado Center for Reproductive Medicine, we were looking at nutrient uptake of individual human blastocysts, good quality human blastocysts, four AAs. And one of the things that we noticed was that the human embryo, the blastocyst, produced a lot of ammonium. Therefore, the embryo has the capacity to alter its immediate environment, and that's a really significant point. The embryo itself is constantly changing its environment. These data were on human embryos exposed to uh, an ammonium gradient. And what we observed, this was um, donated cryopreserved to pronucleate oocytes cultured in increasing amounts of ammonium. And at 75 micromole, which is the level you'd see after just a 24-hour exposure of uh, amino acids to 37 degrees, we started to get an impairment of oxidative capacity in the human embryo itself. So with the advent of heat-stable dipeptides, we've been able to get rid of glutamine, which is the major source of ammonium. But we've not completely alleviated um, the problem. And at 75 micromole, the human embryo's metabolism is affected. pH drift. pH is a real problem, certainly for the pre-compacted embryo, where the embryo is so much more sensitive to its environment. And this slide shows what happens when you take a bicarbonate buffered medium and you change the CO2 in your incubator, you get this rapid rise um, in pH. And that happens every time you take a dish out of your incubator. In a very rapid time, in a matter of just a few minutes, you see those increases in pH. And pH is, again, a very profound effector of cell physiology. Now, oxygen. This is something I've uh, had a little think about for the last 20 years or so. What do we know about oxygen? Historically, and for some reason, human embryos have been cultured um, at 20% oxygen. Tissue culture is always performed, typically always performed at 20% oxygen. And this is probably the reason why uh, when IVF started to expand in the 80s, we moved away from low oxygen to high oxygen. Most tissues only ever see low oxygen and within the female reproductive tract, there are indeed low levels of oxygen. Now, if you go through the literature and look at every study to date on mammalian species, whether it is a sheep, a mouse, a pig, a cow, or a goat, you will see advanced embryo development in reduced oxygen. In fact, in some of the ruminant species, it's very difficult to get embryos to grow at all at high oxygen. And there's some very nice work done on the human, and Marius Menkes did a very elegant study uh, published in Fertility Serility a few years ago. Here's the thing. All stages are vulnerable to oxygen. This was a time-lapse study we did. Uh, the investigator was my graduate student, Petra Whale. And Petra used time-lapse to compare 20% to 5%. And what she found was by the first cleavage division, there was a delay. And that this delay got bigger and bigger up to the eight-cell stage. And she did crossover experiments and found the detrimental effects were irreversible. So if you grow an embryo at 5%, uh, rather at 20% and then move it to 5%, it's game, set, match. If the embryo ever sees 20% oxygen in culture, you have a serious problem. And you always end up with lower cell numbers in your blastocysts. And this is, culminates in a loss of viability. So if there's something from any of this talk you want to take away, if you're, not using high oxygen, if you're not using low oxygen, go to low oxygen and you will see an increase of about 5% in your pregnancy rates. Further data, when you look at gene expression of embryos, oxygen at 20% compromises gene expression. If you move down from the genome to the proteome, you'll see that 20% oxygen has a greater adverse effect than 5% oxygen on the proteome. 
And then following it through to the ultimate home, the metabolome, oxygen affects the turnover of both amino acids and carbohydrates in a mass model. These data, I just wanted to show that have a profound effect. The yellow is the 5% oxygen, and the blue is the 20% oxygen. And there's a number of amino acids at the blastocyst stage that have significantly affected in their utilization by simply changing the oxygen concentration. Interestingly, we know that in the human blastocyst, this is data taken from single blastocyst transfer. This is work done with Michelle Lane at Repromed, published in Human Reproduction a couple of years ago, where we looked at glucose uptake by individual human blastocysts prior to transfer. And what we know is that those embryos with a higher glucose uptake are those that give you the pregnancy. If you look at the effect of oxygen on blastocyst glucose utilization, there's a significant decrease in the very biomarker that is related to viability. Interestingly, we now know that there are synergistic effects, and this is where things in the laboratory get scary pretty quickly. This is a follow-up paper where Petra looked at the effects not of just oxygen on its own, but looked at ammonium and how it interacted. And the conclusion from that was that if you have one stress, you've got a problem. <clears throat> but this was written um, in the journal, this commentary, and it was simply entitled, When Stresses Collide. And it exemplified the fact that if you have two stresses, you can get into deep water very quickly, and sometimes you wouldn't even know about it. Shear forces. It's now been documented that the very act of pipetting itself, vigorous pipetting, can activate stress proteins within the pre-implantation embryo. So unless one is very uh, gentle with their pipetting, one can inadvertently activate a stress response. Then what about single versus group culture? If we grow embryos individually, and if we grow them in relatively large volumes, any factor that's produced by the embryo, any autocrine factor, is diluted out and becomes ineffectual. Whereas if we grow embryos in smaller volumes, and if you grow them in groups, you have the capacity not only to stimulate this autocrine loop, but get a paracrine effect. And there's many studies in the literature on different animal models, whether it's the mouse, the cow, and the sheep. I could have presented lots of different data that show that growing embryo groups is associated with improved embryo development and improved viability. But with the moon to time lapse, how would one do that? Well, this is the Prima Vision uh, well technology here, where you're able to grow embryos individually but still get the beneficial effect of the paracrine, autocrine effects, because the embryos are grown literally together and yet separated out. Okay, so this leads us to the, the summary of the talk, really, is where are we at now? So we had sequential media. Um, these media were first published in the literature in 1994, so they celebrate their 20th anniversary this year, which I think is something. And now there's a massive demand for time-lapse as a tool for embryo selection. So we have developed a time-lapse medium. We've called it GTL. So where are we with regards to the physiology and the stress balance within these two systems? Well, in a sequential system, you can change the nutrient pool to mirror that in vivo. So it's based on physiology. You get to remove all of the ammonium. So you know full well there is no problem with that because at changeover, you start again at base levels. This approach is physiological. The nutrients that we used to make G1, G2 were those based from the human oviduct and uterus, so they were physiologically based, and they've been proven. The first prospective blastocyst transfer trial was done in 97 and 98, that were using sequential media, and the first single blastocyst trial was done using these media. So they work, they're effective. However, what we do know is more pipetting could induce stress factors in your embryos, and you would also get a loss of paracrine factors from the early cleavage stage because you then move your embryos into a fresh medium. In contrast, in the time-lapse system, you're no longer taking the embryo out to do um, your cleavage assessment, the scoring of your embryos. So you have the capacity to leave the embryos uninterrupted. So you don't have any pH shifts, and you don't have any temperature drift on day three. Furthermore, you've got less pipetting, 
and depending on your laboratory that could lead to less stress. And you have the cumulative benefit of the paracry factors. So there's lots of advantages in that system. And they've been well discussed before. However, there's no accounting for the nutrient gradients that we've talked about or the toxic metabolite buildup in terms of ammonium. So there's the compromise. So concluding thoughts. We work in an artificial environment. We do not work in vivo. So by default, we expose our gametes, our embryos, to various sorts of stresses. And most of these have the capacity to impact embryo development. And indeed, in some cases, they can have downstream effects. We know that amino acids are not only metabolized, but they, only, they spontaneously break down to produce ammonium. And that should be taken into account. Atmospheric oxygen is highly detrimental to embryo development. It affects the gene expression, it affects the proteome, and it affects the metabolism. And indeed, there's an interaction with atmospheric oxygen and ammonium. So whereas if you were running a system and ammonium is allowed to build up and you were concomitantly using 20% oxygen, that is really a recipe for disaster. These stresses, even transient ones, can have downstream effects. So IVF outcome is therefore a balance of these stresses. And indeed, which of these has the greatest impact is now uh, under evaluation. So it's always a pleasure to stand up in front of you and represent a very talented group of people. I'd like to thank uh, VitraLife, one of my research sponsors, for their continued support in terms of grant support, uh, the Australian government, my postdocs, um, my army of students, and my collaborators, both within Australia and my dear friends around the world. That's a lot of students. Thank God most of them handed in over the last few weeks, so um, I'm going to sleep a lot better moving forward. And it's a pleasure that I can see that Petra has gone from graduate student and now Petra is working as a laboratory supervisor at Melbourne IVF. Okay. Thank you very much.